Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Face the Truth. Just had a great talk with Steve Byrne. Um, it was enjoyable for me anyways, as I'm a huge fan of comedy and he's uh, one of the greats. Um, but what an awesome time to be able to just talk about comedy and uh, the experiences that I got through it because of him. I mean, he invited me to open for him about a year ago at the Chicago Improv and it was a life-changing experience, something I'll never forget. So there's that. And Steve also worked on his first movie uh, that he directed, The Opening Act, starring Jimmy O. Yang, uh, Cedric the Entertainer, Bill Burr, Tom Segura, a Alex Moffat, Whitney Cummings. Uh, gosh, I'm missing a bunch. I painted them all uh, for his movie poster, which is really cool. But anyways, a huge, awesome cast. Uh, he did a killer job on the movie. I think you're really going to enjoy it. And I think you're really going to enjoy this talk. Uh, Steve really gets into it. Steve is really fun to talk to, shares some really fun insight on the movie and a bunch of other things. So I think you're really going to enjoy it. So anyways, enough of that. Do we even need intros? I don't know. Anyways, please welcome the one and only Steve Byrne. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining me again for this, man. This is awesome. No, yeah. Thanks for I'm nice uh, for glad me. to talk to you again. Where are you at right now? You're on the East Coast? Florida. Oh, you're in Florida. Okay. At yeah. your parents? Yeah. Yeah, I'm at my folks' place. Yeah, so it's, it's pretty awesome. nice here. Yeah. Getting away, getting getting that, that nice uh, mom and dad treatment away from COVID. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Trying to, you know, bring it, bring it potentially to people that are most in danger of it. Uh, people that yeah, are yeah. 65, so yeah. <laughs> that's nice that's awesome um are you are you uh traveling right now doing uh shows or is that not really started yet i'm supposed to be i was in cleveland uh a week ago and had a great run of shows at hilarities in cleveland so it was a lot of fun to get back on stage and then uh yeah i've had some dates throughout november that just haven't really uh they're, they're getting kicked down the road yeah so it's, we'll it's kind of up in the air see what's going on yeah that's yeah. what I figured. It's crazy right now. How did it feel getting back on stage again? Was it good? Uh, it was. Yeah, it was great. It was so fun. It's 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 great to be back on stage. It's great to, um, you know, I, I think that when what sucks is that I, I'm used to working almost every week, mm -hmm. so it's almost like training for a marathon. Right, you're running every week and you're feeling up to speed. You got your win, and the minute you get pulled off the road you lose your pacing right so for me when i get back on stage after having a month off it's like i got to find my melody again because every joke has a melody um, yeah you just got to hit the right notes and it's there's beats and measures to each joke so it's just a matter of just getting back to that and finding that melody again and it just takes it takes a few shows so if i start on thursday my weekend ends on saturday by saturday i'm like all right i got it now but then the week's over so so i'd be ready yeah. for the next week but it's probably not going to happen for another few weeks. Yeah, that's got to – it's really crazy. I mean I – because of you um, uh, being in my podcast the last time, you invited me to do stand-up with you, yep. um, which really ultimately just like changed my life to be honest because finally wow. got me out of my comfort zone yep. um, and I did it. I took the challenge. I spent like – I think it was like five or six months just trying to get five minutes and then I did it. I, you know, and it was like one of the most, it was one of my the best nights of my life, to be honest. Oh, it was amazing. Awesome. That's great. Oh, yeah, that. dude. I couldn't stop grinning when I went back in that, that green room. I just, I, 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 I fucking did it, you know? It and then I couldn't stop. Like, I just, yeah. I kept going like every week. I started going two, three nights a week. Um, and I just, I was just getting new material and just trying new things. And, and I, I, did, I didn't care anymore about that, that initial fear. It's just, you know what, I'm going to go there, I'm going to just try stuff, you know, get this new ideas out, mix this bit with that bit, see how that works. Oh, sure. me, I can work on this, go back. So I was just back and forth, back and forth. And I was really, really loving it. And just, you know, and I was so grateful because my wife was actually letting me go out. You know, she was like, like very pregnant during those months. Yep. And, um, and then I'm going out to these open mics. And I, just, I couldn't stop doing it. And then all of a sudden, all this stuff happened. And sure. so... Um, I mean, luckily, I don't depend on it as a career. Um, it's something I, I plan on. I still want to pursue. Like, I, I can't stop writing. I'm constantly writing. And wow, that's um, great. But you did this to me. 
<laughs> so I created I believe, a monster. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I wanted to talk to you about that too. Cause I've, I've, I've talked with several comics about it. Um, and, uh, Kevin Nealon and I have become really good buddies. We talk pretty much every day. And, um, he told me, he's, he's like, what, what was Steve thinking? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I don't know, but, but I did it. And, um, and, uh, I wasn't going to turn that, that opportunity down, but, but, um, I watched, I want to get into your movie. Um, because well, I'll it's, tell you what I was thing. thinking is that oh, okay. I was thinking that when you were expressing to me your curiosity about stand up, I, I was like, well, this sounds like somebody that wants to try it and mm -hmm. you've expressed it. And I just thought you just needed a nudge. Somebody just needed to <laughs> say, this is what you need to do. Otherwise you just keep daydreaming about it and wondering, and then you'd probably end up uh, for your first time in a really shitty circumstance, which could really dictate how you proceed forward. Because so many comics I know, the first time they tried it, it did not go well, uh, and then they stopped. Uh, yeah. A lot of people that I, that I kind of started with or heard through the grapevine or whatever, or even people I meet on the road, they're like, yeah, I tried it once and I bombed, so I never did it again. And I was like, well, if you can be in at least some, a great situation, you'll have a better chance at having a better set. And then you went up and you did great. And then you told me afterwards, oh, that was my first time. And I was like, I was like, yeah, well, that's that's awesome. So so there you go. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I think I think the right response happened. But I think every now and then you meet people on the road, you meet people throughout the course of your life as a comic that I that I have. And it's just like, well, they want to do it. So you just got to spend five minutes and just say, Hey, I, I really think you should do it. Plant the seed. Yeah. And hopefully they do it. And then you did it. And, uh, you know, went really, really well. So I'm happy for you. Yeah, man. I, you know, the, the cool thing about it was for, for me, I, I took that five months seriously. Yeah. And I was like, I don't want to let Steve down. That was like what I was thinking the whole time. Like, I, I don't want, you know, I know I'm not, I'm new at this, but I, you know, I've lived some life experiences um, I feel like I'm a funny guy. I've got a lot of ideas, and I've thought if I if it's if it's a, it's a funny thing for me, yeah, that's what's important. And I just want to get my material down. And so I was just like nonstop that material in my head over and over and over. And then I remember right before the show, you go, "It's okay, bud. Just relax. Like just have fun. <laughs> just yeah, have fun." And then um, I'll never forget like when you came back after I got off stage. I was like, "Did you see it?" And you're like, "Yeah, yeah." And you're like, "It was really good." He goes, uh, you go, it was really good. And then you go, just maybe next time, not, let's not start with the masturbation joke. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, I think if it's, if you had done it a bit longer then yeah. yeah, I mean, it's easy to jump off of those things, but I think when you're <laughs> so brand new to it all and you don't know how to thread that needle, yeah. um, <laughs> It, you know, taking the subject matter is fine. And you can talk about anything you want. You know, I think it's just yeah. like you got to know how to convey that the yeah. proper way. <laughs> I think you were a bit more, a bit more graphic. Um, yeah, I was pretty. You know, it's like, you know, there's like <laughs> Christmas decorations everywhere. It's like, you guys ready? <laughs> Happy holidays. Hey, you go to a fucking <laughs> I'm like, whoa, what happened? <laughs> well, you know, what's funny about that is like, I thought of, and this is how I think of all of that when I'm writing material. Um, I've got a set list right here, and I, 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 I'm organized with it, and, and I try to come up. It's like an essay. Like I have an intro, the middle, and then right. round it up kind of a thing. That's how I was thinking about it. And for the longest time, I'm like, I have to have an – I want to have an intro. Um, oh, I lost you. Uh, oh. Oh, there you go. <clears throat> I want to have an intro that um, that it's just – it's got to be really, really funny. you know. And I kept, I kept going back and forth with that. Um, and then one day I had this memory. I was in I was in my studio about to work and I was trying to think about my writing. Then I had this memory about my about masturbation when I was a kid. And the store and and just me thinking about it had me laughing so hard by myself in my studio that I'm like, that's goddamn funny. And so I was like, that if that makes me laugh that hard, there's gotta be something there. And so that's, that's why. those are the best jokes. Yeah. Uh, the ones that make you laugh. Um because even if the audience doesn't get it at first, you got enough fuel in the tank that you know you'll work on it and you'll figure yeah. it out. But those are the best ones, the personal ones, the ones that make you laugh the hardest. Um, yeah, <clears throat> those, are the, those are the jokes that make it worthwhile. I would suggest any time that happens to you, put pen to paper and write as much as you can. And I remember um, someone had told me about Mitch Hedberg and his process and, and the reason his jokes work so well is that 
he would keep writing about something until you couldn't write anymore. Mm. So he, he took a deep dive on whatever, how silly that ridiculous premise was. He would go as deep as he could to finally mine the gold. And yeah. when he got to it, it's like, all right, there's nowhere else to go. That's the joke. So I think it's like taking those funny things, those things that make you laugh. And in, the, in your mind, you can go to so many places because you're visualizing it, right? But when you're writing yeah. it, you, you're, you're, your pen's got to keep up with your head, right? And I think <laughs> the quicker you can get at that and the deeper you can go, the better the joke will be. Because the worst thing to do as a comic is to go up there and tell a joke and have the audience say the punchline before you. And that's that's because you only went as far as here. You hit the yeah, surface, yep. just like the audience would. But the deeper you go, you go to depths that they would never even imagine. That's where uh, that's where you yeah, find the gold, you know? That's that's awesome to hear that. Like my main, like even now, my, I think my main, uh, you, know, you know, it's just, it's similar with as a, being an illustrator. Like it takes years to like develop a style and uh, like something that's your own voice. Sure. And I feel like comedy is for sure the same way because I, I – but I feel like right now my kind of approach is misdirection comedy. I, right. I like to set things up in a way that makes people feel uncomfortable. And But I don't want that obvious punchline. I want right. to twist it somewhere in there. And and it's, it's funny when you – I actually like when you get the groans sometimes. You know, Like I think that's that's just as good as a laugh. You know? Yeah, <laughs> it, it is redemptive because you know what you're going for. You yeah. – you, you're, look, you're eliciting a reaction, right? And you want the reaction to be obviously funny, entertaining. But if you can get a groan out of it, I think <laughs> it's it's never wrong to get a groan, especially these days with politically correct culture, yeah. that you, you get so many groans. I mean, you watch SNL and you watch Weekend Update and anytime Colin and Michael Che uh, do anything racial, you'll always hear groans. <laughs> and they were telling me that years ago that wasn't the case, but the jokes are are solid. So I don't, yeah. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Yeah. That's funny. Um, you know, so, Oh, it's okay. <laughs> it's that. Yeah. It's, Sorry. it's totally fine. No worries. So, um, you know, this, you don't have as much time, so I want to keep going. I want to get on to the movie sure, yeah. thing because, um, you had, uh, you've been, you know, not besides being, Oh, by the way, before I get onto that, I want to just, go back to what you were talking about, like kind of like a dance or like a, with the way that you do your comedy and coming back to it is a little bit mm -hmm. to kind of get your groove. Um, and I noticed that about your technique. Mm -hmm. um, like I've, I've watched a few of your specials. Uh, I walked, I, I think I've watched all of them, but like I noticed one of my favorite things about it is I like how you, you'll do like a setup, like a, like a, almost like a question for the crowd. Like, right. And, and then you don't just go right into your, your punchline you do explore that question a little bit. You'll maybe ask it again, but in a different way. And then you kind of act it out. And then there's like the punch. And it's just there's something like you said. It's it's very, it's 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 like a like a like a, there's definitely that rhythm, that melody that you have. Um, and it, for me, when I see that kind of stuff, it's like going to school. Like I'm like, oh, I see that. Oh, but it's so it sounds so sometimes like when you get to the punchline, I'm like, oh, okay. Like it just it's it's almost like watching um I don't know if this is even the right way to say it but like some kind of a math equation but like it you make it seem so effortlessly but it's way more complicated there's I can see all the layers in there and it's just like ah oh, it's awesome <laughs> yeah I think well thank you a for all of that that's very kind of you um but I think like my problem with the last four specials I did is that they were too they were so rehearsed they were so crisp they were so clean. And the one thing I always did was I never adjusted audiences' reactions. Um, if a joke didn't do as well, I, I said, well, keep it. That's authentic. That's the hour, right? But I rehearsed the hours so, so much that I literally would only need one taping. And you could do two tapings. But mm -hmm. I would do one taping and not have one speed bump. I wouldn't mess up any rhetoric and go, I got to do that joke over again because I messed up the I, I would just fly through and it was so crisp and clean that um, there was something I'd seen recently where I was like, it just seems it, it's it's good, but it just seems like if I if I just didn't rehearse it as much, I think I need to take my foot off gas pedal. So it just so seems it a, little feel more a little bit authentic. more authentic. I see. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, more in the moment as opposed to just driving forward. I got to get all these jokes and I got to do it right. And I think my next one, I'll uh, 
I'll temper it down. Because I think when you saw him in Chicago, too, I go off the rails a bit more now. Oh, that's I hilarious. Do a lot more crowd work. So You know, I got to say something else, too. You, you, you have – there is something that you have – You've got a charm to your to to you as a person and to your comedy. That's, it's 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 kind of funny because I think well like one of my favorite comics is Bill Burr. I love his stuff so much, and I thought he absolutely killed it on Saturday Night Live. Oh yeah, and all the people that are going ape shit are just being crazy. Um, he he nailed it. It was so damn good. Yeah. But what, what's really funny is, you, I think it was your latest special. Right. Um, after I saw the Bill Burr thing, and I was like, you know. It's funny because Steve has like this almost like good boy vibe to him. But, dude, most of this, a lot of the stuff that you were saying in your last special, I'm like, that's co- very similar to like what I saw Bill Burr do on SNL. And like it's way more edgier than what I remember because I hadn't seen it for a little bit. And I, I don't know. It's just like it, it's, it's kind of strange because right, right now with all the craziness going on, everyone's got to walk on eggshells with their comedy. Yeah. Um, when I watched that one that you, you did, I'm like, holy crap, you say a few things where I'm like, that's so – it's pretty badass. And, and like if it came out now, I think that you'd get some – get the shit sometimes. But how do yeah. you feel about that right now? Because does it change how your approach is right now or do you just you know fuck it? I think fuck it. It's like yeah. you're, you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. And you got to say what you're feeling. And fortunately for me, I'm just – I feel – um a lot differently than most of my friends. They're extremely progressive. I'm more of a centrist. Yeah. So I'll shit on Trump and I'll shit on uh, Biden and I'll shit on black people. I'll shit on cops. I'll shit on everybody. <laughs> yeah. And I think, I so think I you should. That. And there are, <laughs> there's an instance that happened. I, I'll tell you offline of, of what happened, but I, I can't say it, but it was like one of those things where I had to check another comic that's extremely progressive because he was he, he he was of that Apatow camp of like, hey, we got to be responsible for what we say. It's like, no, you say whatever the hell you want. When you're yeah. a comic and you're on stage, you say whatever you want. You're free to say whatever you want because at the end of the day, your audience will find you. The people that want to hear what you yeah. want to say, they'll buy tickets for you. The people that want to hear, you know, the angelic qualities of the progressive left <laughs> where everything's sweet and everybody gets along and you got to hold people accountable – and cancel culture and all that. There's people that buy those tickets for sure. And there are comics on that side that I like, you know, but I don't think a comic should ever tell another comic, hey, you can't say that, you can't say that. Exactly. It just shouldn't exist. Yeah, I, you know, that's one thing that blows my mind too is like, you know, with this whole cancel culture thing, how many, you know, comics have been thrown under the bus, but by also by other comics. And it's just like, dude, I, it's, it's just a weird time right now. I don't, I don't know, man. I don't like it. <laughs> yeah, I, and it's got to be. It's, yeah. it's got. It's got to be like like when when I watched uh, back to Burr's thing. When I watched the SNL thing, I rewatched it over and over, and I was like, this is probably in my mind one of the best openings that SNL's ever had. Like it was like such a great set. It was just man, I loved it. It was so good. And then I was completely taken back. I could not believe what was happening in the the Twitter world and everything else. It was just unreal. Well, shocking. The people that are offended have a bigger megaphone, but the majority of America doesn't agree with cancel culture. So yeah. most people just aren't going to go online and tweet and all that shit. They're just going to go, oh, it was fucking great. And here's where they make their voice heard. When Bill does a fucking arena show at yeah. MSG or Bill does an arena show at so-and-so. So they weren't on Twitter, but they bought the tickets and they're keeping him in business. That's ultimately what matters. Yeah, and I love that he didn't really even address it he just basically like, hey, I had a great time. That was awesome. <laughs> yeah, and he did, you know? and he should. And you yeah. shouldn't listen. Look, every bathroom floor has a missing tile. Don't pay attention <laughs> to it. Go on with your day, like, you know? Yeah. So anyways, enough of that. Uh, I just I, – you – besides being an amazing comic, you, uh, and you, you also – have dipped your toe into you know film and um you did the amazing jonathan documentary which is just amazing if if you haven't seen that you got to see that because it's just so good and then you've been working on uh the opening act which before you've been working on the opening act yeah i was than i have lately so yeah <laughs> <laughs> that was a, that was a lot um but um but yeah you asked me if i would work on a poster for it and uh, so excited to do that obviously i'm a huge fan of comedy but i love the movie um, you, you did such, I mean, it's a great movie and, and, and the thing about it for me 
as we mentioned, I mentioned to you before was it, it was, I, I related, I felt myself relating so much to the movie because of the anxieties that you put me through. Yeah. <laughs> Just the feeling, even the, the, the parts in the movie where he's in the green room and, about to go on and all these different things. Like I was like, man, I could, I can just feel that the, the way that you put it all together, it felt so raw, so real as what it's really like. Yeah. And, and I, and I have the perspective now of, excuse me, years before, you know, years and years before now, I just had this, you know, this fantasy of doing comedy or this idea of it, but I had no idea what it really meant or what it felt like and all that. Yeah. But now seeing both sides of it, when I watched the movie, I literally was just like feeling nervous throughout a lot of it, but, you know, excited at the same time. And you absolutely captured that. I mean, it's one of the best comedy movies I've ever seen, like about stand up. Well, thank you. Yeah. I, that was definitely the goal. The goal was to do the best film about stand up, you know, in a very encapsulated real time yeah. version of it. That's why. You know, I think if you feel the anxiety, it's because it's meant to feel like you're on the road with him. You know, there's a lot of static on on camera. You know, the camera was put on, you know, on sticks in, in the first third of the film in the office and the open mic or whatever. But the minute you're on the road, we have a lot more hand, handheld cameras. So you feel like you're in the green room. You feel like you're backstage with them. And uh, and I just wanted people to really witness the trial by fire experiences that you have as a comic for the very first time going on the road. Um, because you're not good at morning radio. You're not good at dealing with hecklers. You're not good at, you know, getting the intros right with the headliners. So you're not good at all those things. When you're not good, guess what? You're probably going to suck. And so his <laughs> first time out on the road, he sucks every step of the way, but he learns and he gets better. And that's the whole point of it is that you're going to get better, but you got to start from somewhere. And that's why the poster is to get to the top. You got to start at the bottom, right? Which yeah. kind of has a lot of gay innuendos that I didn't have any <laughs> anything to do with. Um, <laughs> from a marketing perspective, I always thought, look, you've been to a comedy club, but you've never been on the road. And that's how I kind of describe it to people is that it's not just the 10 minutes on stage. It's so much more than that. And the fact that, again, he's going to suck like all of us do. All of us mm -hmm. have sucked at the beginning of our careers. And that's that pivotal moment at the beginning of it. And Jimmy O. Yang just nails it, man. He he, like I I felt for him so much during the movie. I'm like, oh, buddy, I'll be your yeah. friend. <laughs> like, <laughs> just like so. And so I don't know um, how much of it. I know that obviously you poured so much of yourself into it from your own experiences. But how much of what happens in the movie is actually something that you experienced, um, or is it just small parts that you? exaggerated to make for the, you know more interesting for the movie or um i mean like the, the trailer part hiding yep. out of the trailer like that whole scene did that actually happen to you so i'm going to tell you right now i thought <laughs> to make this the most authentic version along okay. with the inside baseball of the light and all that stuff like all these have got to be real experiences so uh, okay all of it happened i mean once he hits the road everything that happened in the film it did happen to me. Yeah, for sure. I did. I you know, I remember, you know, the radio station oh. thing happened in Los Angeles on KLOS. Uh, the trailer scene happened in Raleigh, North Carolina. I finished the show. And at the time at good nights, the comedy club was upstairs and the dance club nightclub was downstairs. Mm. And you go downstairs and everybody that was at the show is downstairs now. So if you're a single guy, it's like, you know, yeah. all of a sudden it's Chris Palmer territory. It's Alex Moffat. It's like, here we go. <laughs> and I walk down and this girl, she's fucking stunning. She's on the bar. Daisy Dukes, like cowboy hat, like cowboy boots. And she just points me. She goes, you come here. And I was like, yes, ma'am. <laughs> and next thing I know, we're on a highway. We're on an interstate. We're on a main road, a small road, a one lane road. And then we're on a dirt road. I'm like, where the fuck are we? And I ended up underneath the trailer fearing for my life while these two banged right above me so and, wait uh, before because i don't know if people i don't want to spoil too much but basically was her her she had a boyfriend that ended up coming home and you had to hide under a trailer yeah and, and he was the, a, was he a cop or was he in real life he was a marine oh a little a bit scary and so <laughs> yeah a lot more scary so i i go in oh and God. i saw i saw <laughs> guns on the table i saw guns over there i saw shells over here i was like it's like, gee, you pack a lot of heat here, huh? And uh, 
like all that stuff is true. So I couldn't, I had to sit under the trailer because there were stick. We're in the woods. And if I'm walking, he's going to hear it, pump the gun and come out and just blast me. So I had to wait until they passed out. And by the way, this happened to me in 1999. So I didn't have a cell phone. So yeah, oh, I had okay. to walk another two hours to get to a gas station. So I spent two hours under the trailer, two hours walking to the, uh, to the gas station. And it was one of those situations where it's like, oh, my God, this is fucking awful. But you know what? If that was Friday, Saturday, you better believe I was back at the bar <laughs> waiting to see what happened the next night, you know? So kind of uh, crazy. So yeah. when you're waiting there under, under for two hours, uh, you can hear them above oh, yeah. above you the whole time. She, I mean, what did she just think? Of you? Oh, he's he probably just <laughs> the coyotes got him. Like, yeah, she, like, she had to completely ignore the fact block that- me out of her out of her mind yeah so uh, yeah i mean that that definitely happened oh my uh God. the conversations between billy and jimmy in the diner scenes those are all conversations i had when i was younger and i would go out to lunch with the headliner like jim norton or whoever it was mm. at the time that took me out and i'd say the last 10 to 15 years maybe 10 years um now i'm billy g and I'm having those conversations with younger comics. And I invited a good friend of mine, Jod Rudnitsky, who's a great young comic. And he came to a screening and he was like, he was like, do you remember having that conversation with me? Did you write that scene based yeah. on me? I was like, I, I've had that conversation with a lot of comics, you know, because um, yeah. I think we're all we're all looking for that magic way. And then once you're experienced enough, you look down and go, well, there is none. There is none. Believe me, if there was, all of us would be doing it, even now to this day. But you just got to do the work. Yeah, no, that's true. I mean, it's really funny. Before I talked with you about comedy, um, there's, I don't know if you know who Russ Maneev is. Of He's course. a New York comic. Okay. He's, um, I, I ended up meeting him years ago because he hired me to paint a poster for him uh, as a gift for somebody. And I recognized his name, and I was like, I recognize your name. He goes, oh, I, maybe you've seen my comedy before. And then I was like, oh, dude, that I love that. You know, So yeah. we started talking about comedy, and I had him. Uh, he was one of my first people I ever had in this podcast. We talked about comedy, and he's – I was telling him at that time how, man, I just – I really – I had all these questions about it. And he was like, "You're there's no school for this. There's – yeah, it's, you just do it. You just got to get up and do it. And it's just it, – I think it's funny because I don't think people – uh, that don't really understand the comedy world quite get that because from an outsider looking in, it does kind of seem like, oh, there must be, you know, like some magic tips that, you know, someone could teach yeah. you this and that. But it's really like you're never going to know unless you get up there. And that's the craziest feeling. It's the craziest feeling to think you have some funny ideas and then get up there in front of people and then try to deliver them. And uh, yeah, I think it, it'd be the same if somebody came up to you and said, I, I want to draw just like you. I yeah. mean, wouldn't you just laugh? You'd be like, "Are you, <laughs> well, get a pen and paper. And do you have 10 years? Do you have 15 years? It's like, yeah, yeah. that's what it's going to take. Anybody could, anybody can go tonight to a karaoke bar and sing Bon Jovi or Oasis <laughs> or the Beatles or any of yeah. those things. Anybody could do that. You could be the most talented guitar in a cover band. The hardest thing to do is to write Mr. Brightside. The hardest thing to do is to write Hey Jude. The hardest yeah. thing to do is construct that song at, from a from an authentic v- viewpoint and write from from there. So there's a reason Springsteen Springsteen, and there's a reason there's a hundred Springsteen cover bands because that's easy to do. The hard thing to do is be Springsteen. Dude, one of the things you told me uh when you said hey i want you to do this and then you said you better make sure you get to some open mics uh before then yeah (laughs) and so when i live in chicago there's a lot of open mics and a lot of comedy so i was like okay i'll do that but i wasn't i wasn't at that point where i was like okay i'm gonna write write some stuff and then just start going right away because I, I didn't want to eat a big bag of dicks. Like I knew I, – I, I've heard enough stories. It's like I want to make sure even when I go to the open mics for the first time that I at least um, – I didn't want to go up there with a notebook and read off of it, um, yeah. which I, I see all the time when I go to these things. I wanted to be up there and just – the most important thing for me personally was I, I want to have that confidence. And if I don't 100%, I want to, I want to act like it. I want people to think that I'm confident. Sure, yeah. Um, and so 
I, I, that was something I was focusing on a lot was that part of it. So, but by, before I did the show with you, I only did three open mics. Yeah. Um, and the first one actually went really well, but I realized my material was really harsh and it was, I got a lot of laughs and which was yeah. good, but I got all, a lot of, Oh, hell no. And, um, a lot of uncomfortableness. I had, I had a, a pretty harsh religious bit that yeah. I got some good laughs, but most people were like really uncomfortable with it. And I was like, I really think this is a funny idea, but it's not going to be appropriate for me opening up for Steve Byrne at a huge club. So I'm like, okay, X that one. But I only, I only did two more open mics. Yeah. And the second one went really well too, yeah. as well. It went well, and uh, um, and I got really good laughs. And then a week before I opened for you, I did my last open mic, and it was crickets. There was yeah. there was mostly comics in the in the room. Well, that's and yeah. Nothing. They're the, they're the worst audience. They're the most judgmental. Yeah, of anybody. And it was the material I was going to go with, and I'm like, oh man, like so I had the worst taste in my mouth before I I went to the show, and I was. Mm -hmm. Like I was feeling pretty good about it until I did that last one, and then the next one was going to be with with you, and I'm like, oh man, and it, the the greatest feeling in the world was, in a, within about five seconds of me on stage, I got my first laugh. You got a like, laugh out of the gate, oh, yeah. Okay, you know, and it, it just helped, but that's that that part of it though that I think is is interesting is I I can tell that if I continue to do that, that it would only get easier and more comfortable after time. But yeah, that's that thing about what you, what you were able to capture in the movie. Yeah. That was, I think that's a hard thing to capture that, that, that feeling. And I thought it was just like, like I was, I watched the movie, I think three times because I, I was the first time I just watched it. The second yep. time I started doing sketches while I was watching it. I right. just wanted to like get ideas at the first time I was watching it with my wife and, yeah. um, and I, she was like, I was sitting there like I had a pillow on my. I was going like this. <laughs> yeah. just, I was like, I feel nervous. <laughs> uh, but it's just funny because. <laughs> but I think it's a it's a it's done in a good way because, um, it it captures that, you know, I'm I'm the kind of person personally that when I want to do something I go for it and I you know, um, I don't think even if I bombed right away the first time I would have quit. But right. I think it would have it would have definitely um, wounded me a little bit, <laughs> you know, like where sure, it's harder yeah. to do it because it's just that that first step of doing it is is challenging. And yeah, um, I always say that, you know, especially those first few years and I've had sets at the comedy store where I leave my home in Pasadena. I'm working on some new stuff. I drive out there and it does not go well. And you're going to have nights like that. It's been 23 years of doing this for me where I'm like. How did that go so horribly? How did I do so poorly? And and then the next day, you know, it, it sticks with me that it's like getting permanent mark on your face, right? It'll wash <laughs> off, but it's going to stay with you for a little bit. And up the next day, I'm like, why was I beating myself up? And and that's why I, when I lived in LA, I loved going to stores. Is that, is that it was a great barometer of if jokes are going to work or not when I'm on the road and mm. what I needed to work on. So. Uh, Look, whether you're starting off, whether you're 23 years in, you're still going to bomb. You're still going to have crickets. You're still going to have those off nights and it's still going to hurt. But when you're when you're younger, it hurts a lot longer. When yeah. you're older, it'll sting, but it's not going to hurt as much as it used to. Dude, I had I had uh, one of my last nights. I did it be before everything happened. I had one of the greatest experiences for me personally was I started a joke. I got this Bill Cosby bit. And as soon as I said the word Bill Cosby, yeah. half, more than half of the room was like, oh, no, 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 no. Don't do it. Like people were like but moaning and like, no. And I could sense I was losing everybody just because yeah. I said Bill Cosby. But I was like, I got to finish this joke. And so – I paced it out a little bit more, yeah. Knowing that how the how the energy was going, but it ended up working because I got a huge laugh, um, and I had more material to do after that. But I had such a big laugh, I was like, uh, "Thank you, that that that's it for me." <laughs> I just like walked well, off. Well, that's like, <laughs> that's the good news is that you took a taboo subject matter, people yeah. instantly said, "Don't do it," and then you went all in at the table in Vegas yeah. and you won. 
And that's yeah. great. That's a testament to to the joke, first off, first and foremost, it's a testament to the joke. But it's a testament also to the fact that you're willing to go to places and even in just the short time and, and having seen you in Chicago, you do <laughs> you do go to places that that maybe <laughs> most young comics wouldn't, but I think that only is gonna help you it's only going to help pay off down the line with the <laughs> fact that it's like you're going to continue to go to those places. And I think you will like that Cosby joke. You'll be rewarded for it. Yeah, it, it was a great feeling, man. That's that's the best. Um, when you so you've never directed a movie like this before. Um, do you think part of the the confidence it took to be to because I mean, to be able to say, yeah, I can do a movie. Do you think that comes from your years of experience with the comedy where you, you've, I mean, you know, the topic. No, extremely well, well, to but. go with what you're saying. Yeah. I mean, look, I showed up the first day and, you know, Eric Edwards was our director of photography and he's worked with Gus Van Zandt. Peter Billingsley obviously worked on Marvel films and you oh, know, yeah. Christmas story. And he directed couples retreat with Vince. Uh, my second AD Artie's is very experienced. And then I got Jimmy O. Yang, who's coming from Silicon Valley and Alex Walker from SNL in our very first day, in our very first scene, and I'm sitting there, and I'm feeling I'm in over my head because I'd read books, I took master classes, I did everything I could to prepare for that moment. I knew I was still in over my head. And before we started, I just said, I'd like to make an announcement to everybody. I want to thank you for being here. I want to thank you for being part of the crew. But I have to tell you, this is my first time directing. I don't know everything about directing. I don't know everything about cameras and lenses or set design and color palettes and all this other stuff. So please be patient with me. We're an independent film. We got a run and gun. I understand that. But I can assure you, as much as I don't know, I know everything about this story. Everything yeah. about this story. Everything about being a stand-up comic and everything about the journey of the stand-up comic. So trust in me in that. And I'm going to trust in you with your profession. And... And that bought me a lot of credence, but it was also the fact that I was vulnerable enough to say, look, you know, I probably don't know what I'm doing, but as per this scene, I'll know what I want when I leave here today. So, so yeah, I, I, I wasn't the most experienced director, but I'll tell you, I did know that story. And I think that's why the story resonates. And that's why it's so well reviewed is that people are understanding that this is coming from the perspective of even the stakes the stakes are not big. It's designed that way. It's like he's not going to be a TV star at the end of this. He's not going to be a movie star. It's his first weekend, and at the end of the weekend, he just wants his second weekend. Yeah. And that's it. And I, that I second that. weekend, that though, so means, means everything because he quit his job. So you need to know he needs that second week. So the narrative the narrative is not – it's not a Christopher Nolan movie, right? It's, it's not <laughs> intricate. It's simplified probably because – I wanted to simplify for myself, but I also thought mm -hmm. if you're going to go to the beginning, the stakes are that much smaller. As yeah. someone's career progresses, of course, the stakes are going to be bigger. But, you know, I think there are many ro things wrong with Punchline. The fact that she's going to get the Tonight Show and she just started, it's like, OK, it's kind of crazy. Uh, <laughs> there's not lockers in a stand-up comedy club. And that's why I think this differentiated itself from it is that it was strictly about the journey of that first weekend. Yeah, and there was so much heart in it. There's so much, um, like, just you you really capture a good the the, the feeling. Like, I, I love like little little details. This this doesn't really give much away, but the little details at the beginning when he's in his office, showing the character of of what Jimmy's character is like, of how he gives his coworker a a, a gift of pens. Yeah, yeah. It kind of shows pens exploded, and then there was yeah. another scene. There was this, this thing I fought for, I fought for, but it just didn't make the final cut, where Will is leaving the office, and he's driving out after he gets the call from, from Quinn, and he's, it's literally a second, so he pulls his car out, and he's going, and as, as he's going, you're following the car, and as you're following the car, you're seeing the other cars, and there's a little moment where Roy is there, and he's fixing a flat tire on his car. And you see that Roy just nothing ever works good for him. And then and then you see Jimmy's car come back in reverse and he gets out and he helps him with the flat. And then and then the uh, montage kicks back in again. So yeah. I thought it was a great moment. But th yeah. the voice of reason was like, look, we already did this. We know he's a good guy. He got him the pens. So I was kind of 
you know, it was just a great laugh, but whatever. There, there's a lot of things you lose in a film. Yeah, I'm sure. I, I remember you mentioned before with, like, uh, Bill Burr, like, just how many amazing scenes you got oh, with God. him. But, but it would take away from the story because it's just – he's not supposed to be super funny. Yeah, you know? I, and that's that's the – even if I did a director's cut, it would be a different film. If you'd yeah. seen it for the first time, you'd think – the stakes wouldn't be as high. It would be a lot. It would be a lot more funnier. There's a lot of funny stuff we left on the table in that film, but it would take away from the tone. Wouldn't be as grounded. Um, more of a broad film, I mm -hmm. guess. Yeah, uh, yeah. And I, I always wanted to keep it grounded, and you want to keep the tone in a realistic world, like Swingers, like Made, like Vince's early films that were so good. And those had a lot of heart and they had that indie feel. And it was like, that's the template. That's the tone we're looking yeah. for, right? Oh, I definitely felt like that. Now, were you in, similar to, to Jimmy's character? Were you kind of because I kind of got the vibe from from him in the, in the movie that, you know, he's he's he is new at the comedy. Um, he's a he's a really nice guy. Now, does that affect in a way? Because I can imagine you being like a, a really nice person mm -hmm. starting in this world that can be pretty brutal and pretty harsh can be kind of a, a, a hard thing and you have to kind of like, does it sort of uh, give you a, a hard shell after a while? Or you, cause, I, Cause you're I a nice guy. That, yeah. But like, but I, but I think like, you know, like for, I think some people starting off can be like so nice and, and, and it's like, it can be like a messy, you know, they can feel so intimidated that it can be a harder road for them, you know, in that world. Sure. That's a, that's a really good question, Jason. I, I had never been asked that and I never even thought about it. And I'm the comic, and I should have thought about it. So I'm going to ask my friends that. But that's, that's a great <laughs> question. But I have never – there are certainly periods throughout the course of my life where things did not work out the way that you would think they would. And it's not, it's not necessarily a hardened shell. It's giving into the negativity. Mm. And I know a lot of comics. As you know, a lot of comics are not the happiest people on – the best representation <laughs> of a comic you're going to see is on stage, okay? Off stage. <laughs> It's like, how dark are they going to get? Really? That's that's really what it's about. <laughs> so so I've always oh. made a conscious effort to not give in to the negativity, to not go to those dark places, to always try to steer myself towards the light, no matter how dark, no matter how dark it gets. Um, and it does throughout the course of this of this uh, of this career. And the best thing you can do in terms of comedy is have the mindset of a golfer. Ultimately, yeah, you're competing against other people, but really you're competing against yourself. It, your game is going to dictate your future. So if you just put on the blinders and focus on your game, that's all that matters at the end of the day. You're always going to have friends that go that leapfrog you. You're going to have friends that you dust, but we're mm. all stocks in the comedy game. We go up, we go down. Even actors. I mean, you, you watch these actors – that years ago were megastars, and now they're doing mesothelioma commercials on, <laughs> on CNN <laughs> during the day. It's like, are you Martin Sheen? I certainly am. I was like, oh, no, what? You were in Apocalypse Now, and you're doing like a you know, prescription uh, pharmaceutical <laughs> ad. It was, it was kind of depressing. So, look, we're all up and down. Just have fun while you're doing it and get the most out of it you can. And stand-up comedy, you know, I was talking to Billy Gardell. You know, the, char the character Cedric is named after Billy G, after Billy Gardell. Mm. And stand-up comedy, just from being a stand-up alone, has, I look through my pictures, I'm like, holy shit, stand-up took me to Iraq. Stand-up took me to Afghanistan. Stand-up took me to Ireland. Stand-up took me to Japan and Korea. Stand-up has taken me backstage to meet Michael Buble, you know? <laughs> stand-up has <laughs> taken me uh, to meet Tom Morello at the Improv. Stand-up has taken me all these different places with all these great experiences. And it's like those are things you're not going to see on a resume. Those are things you're not going to promote on yeah. Late Night with Seth Meyers. But when you look at the back catalog of all the fun things you get to do from stand-up, just from stand-up, it's like I got this card, stand-up comic, and it's taken me all these different experiences and places. It's like this is the fucking greatest job in the world. Yeah. What would I ever have to complain about? So – so, yeah, I mean, I am pretty happy. I am a, I'm a pretty happy person in general. I mean, I'm not going to say that I don't have my, my dark days, but when you keep things in perspective, um, it's pretty fucking rocking life for sure. That's awesome, man. Well, I know you got to get going. Uh, I just want to say thanks again for joining me for this. I want to and... say thank you for oh, doing okay. the poster. You, you did an amazing <laughs> job. I had gotten the poster 
I thought it was serviceable. I wasn't excited about it, but I thought, look, these people probably know what they're doing. These things are done for a reason. But I know that they have Mondo posters and alt version posters, and I just thought we got all these great comics. Let's get them all on there. And after having met you, and obviously as a big fan of your work as I am, um, you and Alex Ross are two people and Jim Lee, three people mm. that I see on my Instagram post that I'm always excited. And I, I zoom in on the intricacies of all the oh, cool. all the artwork and detail. Um, so thank you for doing it. I, I can't wait for people to see this poster. And and I can't wait to get this poster out to the cast. Uh, you know, I, like Alex is very excited to see <laughs> to see the final poster uh, oh, cool. and all the caricatures. So, man, I can't thank you. Thank you enough, man. Yeah, it, was great. It, it was an epic piece. I've never done uh, something with so many characters in one image before, so it was fun. Well, I'll it get it awesome. to you Friday. Cool. I can't wait to see it. And, and again, thanks again for joining me for this um, and for giving me the opportunities that you have. I really appreciate it. And and all, amazing job on the movie. I cannot um, for to see. I know you've got to do other movies. You've got to. It's got to be so, yeah, in the line we'll because see, yeah. um, I think that you're obviously a natural at it. The, the storytelling, the the filming, the the heart that was in it. It's a great movie. <laughs> Massive cast of, of, of some of the best comics ever. Um, one of my favorites is Tom Segura. His scene is so good. Um, <laughs> it's just perfect for him. But uh, anyways, it's amazing, and I, I just can't wait to see to see what you do. It's um, anybody out there that hasn't seen it, go watch the opening act. Um, especially if you're a fan of comedy, but even if you're not, you're gonna love it. It's it's a great movie. So. Um, thanks for joining me for this, man. I appreciate it, bud. And we'll uh, we'll get you that poster very soon. I'll get you the final yep. version. And I can't wait to see you in Chicago. I think the date's getting moved because of COVID. Okay. But it might it might reopen. We don't know. The club might reopen soon, and I keep my date. But uh, either way, next time I come to Chicago, we're sharing the stage. Sweet, man. I'm working on my set right now. So. All right. <laughs> All right. We'll talk soon. Sounds good, Jason. Take care, buddy. All right. See you. Bye. Bye. You want answers? 